What I wanted to do, at least when I talked to John some months ago, is talk about the essential nature of God. And when you first hear that, it doesn't sound like a missionary topic, does it? It doesn't sound like cross-cultural missions or communicating to the natives or efficient methods of outreach or any of that stuff. And you think, well now, what is, what is the purpose? Why would we want to do that? And it, it goes beyond the theoretical and the abstract. It becomes very practical. Because it affects our work of evangelism. Who is God? I think that's the most important question that we face right now. Is Allah God? Uh, are the Sikhs right? Or is God mumbo-jumbo, God of the Congo, or what? What is he like? You know, I, I saw a debate between Frank Turek and Christopher Hitchens, the atheist. Does anybody know Christopher Hitchens? Very vocal, very dismissive of God. I saw Frank give all these great reasons for the ex existence of God, and Christopher Hitchens comes back and says, I hate God. That's his big response. And he said, so if I don't worship God and tell him how great he is, he's going to send me to hell forever. That's God. And he says, that's disgusting. But that's his conception of God. The question is, what is God really like? What is his essential nature? What is it about God that makes him God? This affects us as workers for God. What kind of a God do I work for? What does he expect out of me? And what happens if I fail? So I went through a time, kind of got into it about 2009, and it was like going into the vortex of doom. You know what a vortex is? It's kind of this thing that spins. And I later learned when I looked it up in the dictionary, it's a depression. Get it? And the idea was I was a complete failure. And, you know, I, I can well imagine that being the case because, you know, I'm not a super stud pioneer missionary. Six foot two, made of cold blue steel and not afraid to die. I'm sorry, but I am the most reluctant Boy Scout that ever lived. <laughs> so it's a miracle that I'm a missionary. Okay? I don't want anybody to get the wrong impression. Ooh, ah, here comes Rob. You know, it's a miracle. It's an absolute miracle that I do what I do. So I can't take credit for it, but then... How does God see me? What does he want out of me? What happens if I fail? And you live with this as a missionary, at least I do. I know there are some fabulous missionaries out there. There's one guy that I know, and you ask him, how are you doing? And he goes, amazing. And you can see all his teeth. He's the kind of guy that makes me shrink in real time when I'm around him. Oh, look at these. Oh, he's so cute. Look at him. He's so small. small. And I think, brother, if I'm supposed to be like that, I am dead. Because I'm not amazing. And he is certified amazing. He's written up in books. I can't say too much more because he can be identified and then, you know, I'm dead. But I'm dead anyway. <laughs> But I mean, if that's what I'm supposed to be like, then <coughs> I'm dead. What, am I, what do I do for God? And here's a question. Why does God let me fail? Have you ever asked God that question? You don't have to raise your hand or nothing, but there are times when you feel like, man, I don't do God any favors at all. Why doesn't he just throw the lightning bolt or flush the toilet or do whatever it does, you know? And then as you're swirling down the bowl, you 
Thank you, God. You're doing the universe a favor. <laughs> but you think, where's the victory? Where's the success? And how come God wouldn't want to do that for me? This is what uh, discourages a lot of missionaries. You're slugging away for God and you're just not getting anywhere. At least that you can see. And this is something I was going through. I thought this fellow was going to take over my church. I was going to move on and start a Bible college in South Africa. And then it didn't happen. And so I, I was all set to leave England, and then I didn't. And this guy came over, and it's like he's amazing. Six Bible studies a week. People getting saved like crazy. They go down to Brighton to get baptized. I'm thinking, man. I am crashing and burning for Jesus here. So I can see other people getting blessed. But what about me? Why wouldn't God want to do that? I mean, don't you think that's what God would want? Let's get victorious. Let's see God do stuff. Let's see revival. But why would God let me fail? It almost looks as though he isn't there. It almost looks as if... Well, who's broken in this, right? God's perfect, and then there's me. So whose fault is it? Well, it's got to be me. I'm broken, right? So what am I doing here? But here's what I found out. And here's what I want to tell you about, because it might save your life like it saved my life. And that is there's something more important than victory or success. Something that we need to know. And that is about this essential nature of God that makes him God. And what I want to do is show you this from Philippians chapter 2. And I'm going to read it. In verse 5, Paul says, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard, regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The first thing I want to point out here is that Jesus existed in the form of God. And the way I explain this the way, the way this word form is used, it means essence. It means something that is intrinsic. And what that means is kind of like the difference between my arm and my sleeve. My sleeve is extrinsic. I'm sorry I have to use these words. We don't use these in conversation. Like, hey mom, would you pass the intrinsic please? But here's what it means. Extrinsic means this isn't part of me. This isn't me. I could change the shirt. I could, you know, put a, a, a shirt with a collar on and a tie, and you'd think I was really something. Or put on, you know, a super dry t-shirt. You'd think, well, he's cool. But clothes don't make the man. That is external. It's not me. But my arm is intrinsic. It's essential. I can't change this. I wish I could look like Hulk. You know, Hulk smash? But you'll never see Rob smash. 
<laughs> just because it's intrinsic, it's essential, it's who I am. I am weak. So when it says here that Jesus is in the form of God, it means he is God in essence. He's not wearing a t-shirt that says God. He is God. When I was coming over on the plane, I saw a guy wearing a Fender t-shirt. And to a musician or a guitar player, Fender means electric guitars. So I thought, here's a guy that plays electric guitar. So I went up and said, hey, are you a Fender guy? And he looks at me and goes, what? I go, you play a Fender, right? He goes, what? And I go, this guy is not a guitar player. He's just wearing the t-shirt. He might as well be having super dry. Does anybody know what super dry means? I don't either. It's Japanese. Who understands them? They're lonely hearts. So Jesus isn't there wearing a t-shirt that says God. He is God. And all the attributes of God are him. So I've, I've done this before where I ask people, does anybody know the attributes of God? And we'll jam on it for a while. Like, okay, he's everywhere at once. He knows everything. Um, he's got all power. All-knowing. All-knowing. That was my thumb. <laughs> Eternal. Eternal. Okay, who else? Love. What else? Light. Light. Okay. What else? Merciful. Merciful. Holy. Gracious. Slow to anger. That's why I'm still alive. All right. Okay. We, we got the general role of things, right? Now, all of these things, Jesus is. And he's not trying to be God. Like, move over, Dad. I, I just want to be God for a while. He is. And the thing about being God is, you are the most high when you're God. Sovereign. Sovereign means you don't have to do anything you don't want to do. We pray, God, help me make the deadline. It's got to be by this point. And God says, I don't have to do anything. And we try to move God, like, oh God, please. God says, hmm. You know? And another definition of sovereignty is you can't take it away from God. No matter what you do, He's sovereign. He can do anything He wants, He gives the orders. Everybody has to obey him. He is top, the most high, CEO, the boss. He is. So the next thing we notice about Jesus is that he did not regard equality with God a thing to hold on to. Now let's just say for the moment that we are the most high. Me and you. We're all the most high. Been the most high for eternity. And then somebody says, Hey Rob, want to give it all up? And I go, mm, Let me get back to you on that. It's fun to be God. Right? You don't have to ask anybody's permission. You're God. So, I would have a hard time giving it up. I have a hard time giving money. If somebody were to say, hey Rob, you want to give $100 to a really good cause? I'd go, inside I would go, ah! But I would try to preserve my cool and say, let's pray about it. <laughs> let's pray really hard and long about it. Here's what Jesus says. Okay. And so, it says here, he emptied himself. 
And you know, we really don't know all that that entails. We have some idea. He didn't stop being God, but, you know, he went from measuring the universe with the span of his hand. Unimaginable distances. To going down to one speck in one part of a galaxy. And he's on this little ball of dust and then he became a zygote. One cell. And he grew as a regular human being. Now, anywhere from the top is down. But he went way down. Super down. And it says here, he took the form of a bondservant. Same word as in verse 6, form, meaning essence, meaning he's not wearing a t-shirt that says slave on it. It's who he is. It's intrinsic to him. And he's God, and he's a slave, and it's not a contradiction. He is everything that a slave is. So what's a slave? Kind of like a wife. My mom used to say, I want a wife too. They're handy. <laughs> when do I get my wife? But a slave is somebody who belongs to somebody else and serves that somebody else and is swallowed up in the will of somebody else. Doesn't think about himself thinks about obeying his master. That's what that kind of a slave is. It's the lowest. So he went from being the top to being on the bottom. Way on the bottom. And all those attributes that we think are necessary to being God, he left behind. It'd be like if I showed up without my arms, without my internal organs, right? Everything I would think of being essential to being me, he came without. And then he says to Philip, Have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And you know what the disciples were expecting? They want to see power. They want to see the glory. They want to see God. And Jesus is going, you guys, look at me. You're seeing God. And they didn't see it. They're going, what's he talking about? I don't know. Don't say anything. <laughs> He's yelling at us, so just... Don't say anything more. <laughs> Do you know what we look at when we see Jesus? We're seeing humility. And humility is the essential character of God. It's what makes God, God. And you see, this is the next point that Paul talks about. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Now, this word appearance means the t-shirt. He was absolutely human down to the last cell, but that isn't who he is. But the important thing about Jesus is that he humbled himself. Now, everybody else you read about in the Bible had to be humble. Everybody. Think about Job. God himself says, have you ever seen a guy like him? He is righteous. Even Job needed to be humbled. He didn't humble himself. He goes, I don't get it. I didn't do anything wrong. And I will not be quiet. He did this to me and I didn't do anything to deserve it. 
He didn't get it. God humbled him. And he humbled David. And he humbled Paul. And he humbled Peter. Every single person needs to be humbled, but Jesus is different. He humbled himself because he can do that, because he's God. And it says here, he became obedient to the point of death. What it means is, he didn't think about what it would cost him to obey God. You know, obedience is doing what somebody else wants you to do. It's not doing what you want to do. And there comes a point when you obey somebody that it runs against you. You're going to suffer if you're going to obey what your superior says for you to do. The one that you need to obey, ought to obey, should obey. And so that's what happened to Jesus. Because what God wanted Jesus to do is to serve every single man, woman, and child that's ever been born or ever will be born by giving his life as a ransom. By taking on the sin of the world. By doing what nobody could ever do for themselves. No man can give God a ransom for his soul. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? We're broke. And when we sin, we forfeit our souls. So we can't buy ourselves out. We can't give enough stuff. What if I gave you all of my gold? And God goes, he's just created billions of universes made of solid gold. Gold means nothing to him. I'll give you my iPod. <laughs> Six billion universes made of solid iPods. <laughs> so this stuff doesn't mean anything to God. What means something to God? Love. Love. Obedience. 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 Okay. Now look. All of that comes from humility. Everything good comes out of humility. Like obedience. If I'm concerned about myself, my comfort, my welfare, and then this command comes from God, I need you to go to this country and live here and do this, I go, well, sorry, I'm an American. And my cultural heritage as American is skippy, creamy, and, you know, 7-Eleven supersize. And I know that where you want to send me, they don't have those things. So, see, sorry, I'm out. Fair and square, right? The joke is that it's not like that anymore. It used to be in the olden days when you got a, a care package from church that would send you red licorice whips and Swiss Miss cocoa packets. Because they knew you couldn't get that stuff. And we would go, Red licorice and Swiss Miss. But nowadays you can get it all. I have a Costco that's just down at the end of the street. And we were like those who dreamed. You know what? I used to drive uh, a solid 40 minutes at 70 miles an hour to get to the nearest Costco. And I used to say, wouldn't it be great if we had like a Costco at the end of the street like my friends in Seattle? And we just pick up a gallon of milk on the way home? I can do it now. I go, thank you, God. Costco, down the street. It's a miracle. <laughs> but if, if I'm concerned about the quality of my life and the impact of my life, I am not going to obey God. Does that make sense? And so at a certain point, you cannot think about yourself and obey God. They're, they're mutually exclusive. How about love? You know that love suffers long and is kind? What that means is, you're kind of quirky. You're kind of like a porcupine. You're hard to love. 
You try my patience. How do you hug a porcupine? Answer, very carefully. Ow, 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 ow. See, if I care about my own personal comfort, I'm not going to love you because you drive me nuts. But if I'm not thinking about myself and my relationship with you is more important than my own comfort, I will love you. I will bear all things. Because I love you. That's love. How about faith? You know, if I'm looking at myself, I'm not going to trust God. He's going to make me marry somebody I don't like and then send both of us to Africa. <laughs> Forget that. But then, if I look away from myself and I look to God, that's faith. Or worship. If I'm looking to myself, I'm not going to say God is so fantastic. I have to look away from myself to God, and that's worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Every good thing comes out of humility. So look at this. Jesus has fully disregarded himself, and he's God in order to fully please God and serve everybody. And so it says, for this reason also, God highly exalted him. Did God exalt Jesus because he was everywhere at once? Because he knew everything? Because he was all powerful? He left all that stuff behind. There's only one reason why God highly exalted Jesus. Not for what he could do, but for who he is. For the reason of humility, God has highly exalted him and says, that is who God is. Not only that, he's going to make every created being bow down and say, Jesus is God. Jesus clearly shows us who God is because God is humble. And everything good comes out of humility. Now, the only other way to think in the whole universe is to think about yourself. There's no third way to think. You're either thinking about others or thinking about yourself. Now, this is what the devil did. This is how the devil thinks. He thinks, look at God. I mean, power, glory. Okay, I get it. But I got power and I'm glorious. So why should he be God? I want to be God. Makes perfect sense to me. And he did some campaigning and got a third of the angels to go along with him. So he says, hey, I want to be God. I want to be like the Most High. I want to be the boss. And out of that arrogance has come every wicked thing. Because I'm hot stuff, I don't care anything about you. I don't care if I trample on your rights. If you got something I want, I'm going to take it. Why? Because I'm something and you're nothing. So give it here. And see, the devil's the one that says, hey, I want you all to worship me. And if you don't worship me, I'm going to beat you. And if that doesn't work, I'll kill you. So that image of God that Christopher Hitchens is so disgusted at, it's not God at all. It's the devil he doesn't think is so cool. Because Christopher Hitchens is not only arrogant, but he's ignorant. And unfortunately, he's dead. Every wicked thing comes out of pride. And pride is worthy of everlasting shame and contempt. You see, power in and of itself is not worthy 
There's power in an A-bomb. There's nothing worthy about setting one off, right? So power in itself is neither here nor there. And glory is not worthy in and of itself. You get all these beautiful people who live so badly. They live in such a disgusting way. But they get away with it because they're beautiful. You know, only a really beautiful person can like dye their hair blue and get tattoos all over themselves. And everybody goes, oh, wow, I just want to be like that, you know. They get away with it because they're beautiful. But so what? It's not worthy of anything. But denying yourself to enrich and benefit somebody else, that's worthy. That's what God is saying. He's saying, this is who I am. And he's saying that of his son. He's willing to exalt Jesus because Jesus really explains who God is. So, to go back to the opening questions, think about this. Is God so consumed with himself that he makes everybody worship him or else they go to hell? See, you can come to somebody who has that kind of frame of mind and say, that's stupid. And you say, well, this isn't really what God is like. God is the one who says, I'm squared away. I'm okay. I'm going to make it. But what about you? Are you going to make it? Why not? I will do everything in my power so that you make it. Even to giving you my own life, I'll do it. Because when you make it, I make it. When you succeed, then I will succeed. Your victory is my victory. When you're glorified, then I will be glorified. Isn't that fabulous? Now here's what the devil says. I'm fabulous. You're scum. I'm on the top. You're on the bottom. You serve me and I beat you on the head. And I win and you lose. Here's what God says. When you win, I win. And everybody wins that way. Isn't that a huge difference? That's who God is. That's the God that we're making known. So then the next question is, who is this God that I'm working for? What happens if, if I don't produce? Well, the answer is, he's not interested in your abilities. He's not saying, oh wow, you know, he's a great surfer. I could use that. I've been needing a good surfer for a while. Because with that surfer, I can do lots of good things. I'm so lucky. Does God need that? It's not really our abilities. It's not being fantastic that God requires. What God requires is somebody who explains him in the right way by their own life. In other words, it's humility that shows that there's a God because it's so unnatural, don't you think? In reality, it's like, oh, no, that's okay. You don't have to clap. That, that's all right. Don't do that. It's okay. Hey, don't worry about it. It's all right. Everybody wants that. But here's somebody who doesn't really care about themselves. They're not jabbering about themselves all the time. They care about me. That's kind of unusual. What are they in it for? What are they trying to get out of me? I mean, they're not trying to get at anything? They just want to do good for me? That's different. That's weird. That's unnatural. You see, this is, this is the impact that, that that character brings. And you don't have to be a PhD propeller head to get there. In fact, God chooses the things that are not in order to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should boast in his presence. And I thought, I'm qualified. <laughs> I'm so qualified. Because I am nothing. 
you know, I can do all sorts of stuff. I'm, I'm gifted. I'm talented. For what it's worth, I'm kind of a genius. And what has that added up to in my triumphant missionary career? The answer is zero. Frustrates the ever-loving daylights out of me. <sighs> what is the deal? How come I'm dying? Why am I tanking like this? What possible use is there in me being completely barren and unfruitful? What are you doing, God? This is the next question, is it not? And here's the answer. There's something more important than being victorious and being successful. And that is learning Christ. We are learning a person. We're not learning a number of mathematical theorems so that we can barf them out correctly on the test. We're talking about learning a person. And we have to learn to think like him in order to act like him. We cannot act like Jesus unless we think like him. And that means everything about us has to change. Not just get the God t-shirt on and know all the moves and the right thing to say at the right time. It has to be because I have turned away from myself and I'm not looking at myself and I'm trusting in God who is sovereign. God can do anything. He doesn't need me. He just wants me to show up. If I show up, he can work. He gets all the glory. Now, the danger is that you can be successful. You can be victorious. And you can think your hot stuff whose underarms do not smell. <laughs> You're not like other people. Did you know that Steve Jobs thought that he did not smell? Do you know that he smelled terribly? He thought it was hot stuff. But this is a danger. Because you can say, you know what? Everybody ought to be like me. And unfortunately, you're not. Sorry. Tough luck. Better luck next life. You know what? Everybody who's proud ruins their lives. Did you know that? Guaranteed? It's in Proverbs 29, verse 23. A man's pride brings him low. And that doesn't even begin to describe how low. Every proud person is going to utterly destroy their lives. It's guaranteed. But it also says in Proverbs 29, verse 23, a humble man will obtain honor. The secret of Christ is that he trusted God. Absolutely. He says, you made me to trust in you upon my mother's breasts. From the very beginning, he trusted God. His whole life is about trusting God, not trusting in himself. So you know what? God is doing something in you when he's not giving you victory and success. In fact, if you read Psalm 66, he will throw you into his net, which means he restricts your freedom. He'll put you in a pit like he did to David in Psalm 40. A pit you can't get out of. And then he will give you a burden beyond your strength. You said, wait a minute, 1 Corinthians 9. He won't let us get tempted, or 1 Corinthians 10. Tempted beyond what we're able, but this is a burden that I can't carry. Exactly. 
What's he want to do with it? Crush you? Burden you beyond hope until you're despairing? He wants to let the enemy trample you underfoot and go through fire and water. Why in the world would he ever let you do that? I mean, if God really loves you, why would he let you do that? Does that mean God doesn't care? No. He cares incredibly. But the purpose is, is to make you like Jesus. And if you think about Jesus, he did not end his life very triumphantly. He was betrayed. He was unjustly accused, unjustly condemned. Beaten, scourged, spit upon, mocked, nailed. He saved others. He cannot save himself. All you have to do is come down off the cross. And he says, well, I could get 12 legions of angels and scorch this stupid planet. But instead he says, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Only God could do that. And see, he takes us and crushes us and melts us to purify us. And it has to happen so that we finally look away from ourselves. There is no plan B. This is so bad that if God doesn't save me, then I'm dead. So I say beyond all sense, I say, God, save me. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of your mouth. This is what your word says. God, save me. And then he saves you. See, he wants you to look away from yourself and not ever think to look back and go, you know what, if he wants to kill me, that's okay. Whatever you want, God. Anything you want. I'll do anything you want. Here I am. God says, okay. Now we're cooking with gas. Now I will do something through you that is bigger than your life. It's more than just you at stake. Because when you are that dead with Christ, you're also alive with Christ, and it is a sign and a wonder. It says in Psalm 40, many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Why? Because I was in a pit, and I was dead, and God brought me out, and He is God, and there is no other, and His name is Jesus, and I am the living proof of it. You want to see proof that there's a God? Check me out. I'm a miracle. I shouldn't be alive. That's what people need to see. Not just jabber, 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 and your life says, no way, I don't believe a word of that. That's a bunch of hooey, man. That your life and your mouth agree, and there's no contradiction. You are the living proof that there's a God. So, do you know that in this life, it's not just isolated pockets of being humbled. The whole thing is humility from start to finish. Just like Jesus. You know why? Because afterwards, it's all glory. All glory. The glory that's right here, right now, it's nothing. Steve Jobs is dead and I waited until his biography showed up in the, in the goodwill. I wasn't going to pay 20 bucks for that thing. <laughs> it took a few years. The really quality biographies will take a few years, but just wait, and there it was, and I bought it for two pounds. And I said, yes. The glory here is nothing. But when you stand before God and he says, well done, good and faithful servant, that's forever. And it lasts. And it contradicts everyone who says you're nothing. You're useless. You're worse than useless. You're nothing. All that matters is when God says, well done. And that's why you stay where he puts you. 
And no matter what happens, you say, you know what? It doesn't matter if anybody says, hey, Rob, good job, pal. Who cares? The only thing that matters is doing God's will and hearing Him say, well done. You did what I wanted you to do. Does everybody understand me? That is what is happening in your life right now. If you're trusting in Jesus, He is bringing about this character of Jesus in your life. He's making you like Him. Everything good comes out of humility and everything wicked comes out of pride. And God loves you so much, He will pound you into oatmeal so that you learn Christ. And so you will thank Him in the end. Only God can do that. Can you imagine Nebuchadnezzar eating grass for seven years? And one day, kind of looks up. (laughs) 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 Thank you, God. Thank you for making me eat grass like a cow for seven years. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Only God can do that. And you will thank God too. So, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to glorify you tonight because you are worthy of all praise and glory and wisdom, honor and might because you are meek and humble. You don't think about yourself. You're not hung up on yourself to the point where you would send Jesus. <coughs> and Jesus, you did not consider yourself. You gave yourself for us to love us, to benefit us, to save us. And we thank you for working in our lives to teach us you so that we learn you and know you and love you. Keep doing that in our lives. And Lord, anything you want, you can have it. Big, small, wherever. If only we can hear you say at the end, Well done. That's what we want. Thank you so much. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.